Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff. Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to be talking about scapular movements. We'll be looking at what's involved in each movement, and then we'll talk about the muscles that control each of these movements. Okay? And we really want to focus on understanding why the scapula moves as it does. Okay? So before we get into that, let's review a little bit of anatomy here. Okay, so we have two scapula. Okay, there's a left one and a right one. And if we're looking at it in this view, we're looking at a posterior view. How do I know it's posterior? Well, this anatomical feature right here, which is the spine of the scapula, is only visible on the posterior aspect. So that gives away that this is the posterior view. Up here would be the supraspinous fossa. Down here is the larger infraspinous fossa. And then this protrusion right here is the acromial process or acromion. But what I'd like to point your attention to for this video is this structure right here, this small concavity on the lateral aspect of the scapula. It's partially covered by the acromial process, but this is the glenoid fossa. And the glenoid fossa makes up one half of the shoulder joint. The other half of it is made up by the head of the humerus. And so the head of the humerus sits right there in the glenoid fossa. We're going to be visiting that over and over again in this video. Here I've removed the left scapula, so you can see how the right scapula sits here on the back of the rib cage. So we're definitely looking at a posterior view here. These are the vertebrae, and right in the middle line you can actually see the spinous processes of these vertebrae. And then these are, of course, the ribs. And so when the scapula moves, it's really going to be gliding really over the ribs. Okay? It can glide up, it can glide down. It can come out, it can abduct, in other words, move away from the midline, which is also called protraction, and it can come back to the midline, or adduct, which is also called retraction, and it can also undergo a couple of rotational movements. Now, the first two movements I think are the easiest to understand. Those are elevation and depression. Now, elevation is simply a glide of the scapula superiorly, or up, whereas depression is a glide down, or an inferior glide of the scapula. Now, elevation is what you would do when you shrug your shoulders up. When you say, I don't know, so you shrug your shoulders up or perform a shrugging exercise in the gym. Now, this movement, scapular elevation, is controlled mainly by two muscles. The most important of these two is the upper trapezius. That's by far the strongest. There is the smaller levator scapulae, uh, which does contribute, but the upper trapezius is much stronger and contributes much more to that scapular elevation, superior glide of the scapula. For depression, by itself, it doesn't really have a lot of range of motion from the base position of the scapula. So really for depression, we normally think of it as once you have the scapula elevated, then bringing it back down to its resting position would be depression. And you can depress it a little bit further, but again, depression from its resting position, there's not a lot of range of motion there. So normally depression, you bring the scapula up, and then you move it back down, that's depression plus a little bit of extra movement inferiorly. And depression is facilitated by the lower trapezius. All right? Now we start getting into a couple that are a little more complicated. Those are scapular protraction, also called scapular abduction, abduction, and then retraction, also called scapular adduction or adduction. Okay? Remember what AB and adduction are. Abduction is movement away from the midline. So if here's your left scapula, here's your right, here's the midline, then if I move the scapula, at least in this picture, to the right, that's movement away from the midline. So that should be scapular abduction, abduction. But generally that's given the name protraction. Now, if this scapula moves back toward the midline, that would be adduction. Remember, adduction is movement toward the midline. However, we typically refer to that movement as retraction. To really keep these two straight, retraction and protraction, if you think of retraction like retracting a cat's claws, when the cat retracts its claws, it brings the claws back toward them. So the scapula moving back toward the midline is retraction. Okay, now protraction, the muscles that facilitate this are mainly serratus anterior and pectoralis minor, with a little more contribution from the stronger serratus anterior, sometimes called the boxer's muscle, and we'll explain why that is in a few minutes. 
Retraction, bringing the scapula back toward the midline, is facilitated by mainly two muscles. Those are the middle trapezius and the rhomboids, both rhomboid major and rhomboid minor. I guess that's three muscles. And sometimes they'll give a fourth here, although it's really not in a position where it can really act much with retraction, but it can contribute a very small amount. And that's levator scapulae. Mostly levator scapulae is involved in elevation of the scapula. Now, why would I want to retract or protract the scapula? To answer that question, you really need to understand why there are movements of the scapula in the first place. So I want you to remember that this glenoid fossa of the scapula houses the head of the humerus and that forms the shoulder or the glenohumeral joint. And so remember that you can move your humerus all about, right? But really what movements of the scapula do is they alter the range of motion such that it's increased in a particular direction. If that doesn't make sense, take a look at this little analogy I put together using some kitchen utensils. So let's really try to understand the purpose of scapular movements here with a corny example using some things I found in the kitchen. So this coaster right here is going to represent the glenoid fossa of the scapula. This egg whisker is going to be the humerus, and this part of it right here is going to be the head of the humerus. Okay? So if we look at this, we know that the head of the humerus sits in the glenoid fossa of the scapula. Now let's imagine a particular movement of the humerus. It doesn't matter which one it is. Okay? It has a certain range of motion. Now in this, I'm assuming the scapula is not moving. So what if we had a situation where the scapula doesn't move. Well, I'm just confined to that particular range of motion. So let's suppose right here is the limit of that movement, the limit of that range of motion. How could I get this further over here? Well, if the scapula remains static, I might tear a ligament or something like that. So the only way that I can move the humerus further into this range of motion is by changing the position of the scapula, a scapular movement. Look what I just did. I change the position of the scapula, and what does that do? It changes the position of the glenoid fossa, okay? That increases the range of motion of the humerus. So in other words, if the scapula remains static, it really limits the amount of movement of the humerus, and that normally is not what happens. We know the scapula moves. So when the scapula moves, it allows for a greater range of motion in one direction of the humerus. So again, I can go this direction also, move this over here, but this is my limit of range of motion in this direction. So how do I get more movement of the humerus? Well, I move the scapula. That changes the position of the glenoid fossa, and now I have more range of motion. Hopefully that makes sense. Kind of cool, right? Those are the purposes of scapular movement. It's positioning the humerus such that in one direction, it increases the range of motion of that joint. So to further understand this, both scapular retraction and protraction, let's take a look at these two bodybuilders, famous bodybuilders doing the bench press, but at different phases. Over here on the left is Frank Colombo, and over on the right is Arnold Schwarzenegger. We'll first talk about scapular retraction. Retraction is important anytime you want to bring your humerus behind your body. So if you imagine elbowing someone behind you, Bring your elbow back as far behind your body as possible. That gets your scapula uh, retracted as much as possible to position the humerus as much posteriorly as possible. So as he's here in the downward phase of his bench press, notice the humerus has now dropped behind the frontal plane of his body. So the normal range of motion here would be where this green arrow is. Okay? Notice that that is in line with his humerus, and that's what we see here. If we imagine a situation where the scapula was static and couldn't move, his humerus would only be able to come down to here, where the red line is. Okay? So by allowing that scapula to retract, it allows the humerus to go further behind the frontal plane of the body. So increasing range of motion in that direction. That's scapular retraction. Over here on the right, we see Arnold Schwarzenegger in the up phase of the bench press. So this would be scapular protraction. Remember in protraction, the scapula moves away from the midline of the body. And I drew this curve here because it's important to understand that it's not just moving laterally. Because of the curvature of the ribs, it's actually curving a little bit anteriorly also. And so why is that important? Well, look at the plane of Arnold's humerus. Okay? This is it in the green line. 
That's with the scapula protracted. If the scapula were static for some reason and couldn't move, then he would only be able to get his humerus out this far. So by protracting the scapula, it positions that glenoid such that you can get the humerus further anteriorly. Okay? So retraction allows the humerus to come back further posteriorly. Protraction allows the humerus to come further anteriorly. And the reason they call the serratus anterior, the boxer's muscle, is because when a boxer goes into a full punch in front of them, the way that they get that extra motion is through protraction of the scapula. And the stronger your serratus anterior is, the more force you're going to be able to get at the end range of this particular type of movement of the humerus. Okay? So hopefully that clears up a little bit of scapular retraction and scapular protraction. Now we want to understand upward and downward rotation of the scapula. Okay? And the same principles here are going to apply. We need to rotate the scapula sometimes to, again, position the humerus to increase range of motion. And really when we think of upward rotation and downward rotation, we need to think about jumping jacks. Okay? You should do a few of them if you need a little refresher on that. Okay? So we're first going to take a look at upward rotation. Okay? So the three muscles, major muscles of upward rotation are the upper trapezius, serratus anterior, and the lower trapezius. Now, over here, I have this little vector right here that's representing really kind of where the humerus can be sticking out. Okay? And right here in black, this represents the humerus's normal range of motion if the scapula remains static. In blue here is what's going to happen when the scapula undergoes upward rotation. So let's see how the scapula upward rotates on the rib cage. Take a look at this. There's the scapula upward rotating. Notice that now the glenoid is positioned a little bit up. And so now the humerus, when it moves, is going to be able to get a little bit of extra range of motion here that it wouldn't have if the scapula was static. There's upward rotation. So that new range of motion now with the humerus is what we have here in blue. Okay? We increase the range of the motion of the humerus about this much in this direction. So this would be more appropriate when you're in the upward phase of a jumping jack. Now let's consider a downward rotation. You can imagine it's the exact opposite. The two major muscles involved here are levator scapulae and the rhomboids, both rhomboid major and rhomboid minor. So again, here in black, this is the normal range of motion of the humerus if we don't move the scapula. But of course, the scapula can rotate downward. Let's take a look at that. Scapula is rotating down here. And so now look, in blue, we've increased the range of motion of the humerus more in this inferior direction, this downward rotation direction. Okay? So what is the purpose of upward and downward rotation? It's really to increase the range of motion of the humerus upward and downward. And again, we do that by moving the scapula, which repositions that glenoid fossa, which therefore allows the movement of the humerus in that direction. And hopefully now you have a better appreciation for these movements of the scapula and why they're necessary for allowing us to have greater mobility of the humerus for particular movements. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.